Welcome to our viewers and listeners, and welcome, of course, to Jim Rickers, who joins us after a busy news cycle in the U.S. What do you make of the gunpowder treason and plot story? Well, that's about what it is, uh, uh, Nick. That's not a not a bad description. Yeah, we've had uh, uh, we've lear- learned uh, just in the past few days about an attempted uh, coup d'état in America. You know, if you go back to about 1960. Four. I could be off by a year, but I think it's 1964. There's a classic black and white film called Seven Days in May. Uh, with two of my favorite actors, uh, Burt Lancaster and uh, Kirk Douglas, they play the lead roles. But it's got it's got a great cast. But it's basically about uh, a, uh, a a military coup in America, where the commander, the the uh, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, organizes his top officers. They agree that they're going to take over communications channels and uh, announced that they no longer take orders from the president of the United States, who was in effect rendered uh, powerless uh, because of this military coup and uh, they've got secret operations going on. It's a great movie, really recommend it. Um, but we just sort of saw a version of that, maybe uh, Seven Days in May Light um, has, has come to life. So what we're referring to is uh, our, our General Mark Milley, who's a four-star general, by the way. People always ask me if I've met Five, uh, five-star generals. You say you must talk to five-star generals. Well, there aren't any alive. There are no five-star generals. Uh, there, there have been in the past, but the the most recent ones died some years ago. So our highest ranking f- uh, so-called flag officer is a um, is a four-star general. And that's what Millie is, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But he, um, according to a book by Bob Woodward, and Bob Woodward has been writing books for forty years, pretty good track record. Um, that. Uh, a day or two before the election, before the 2020 election, that was Trump versus uh, Biden, of course, uh, that there was you know, fear that Trump would do something crazy. Uh, if he lost the election, he would uh, you know, surround the White House and install himself as a kind of dictator or whatever. So Milley called our you know, General Milley, a chairman of our Joint Chiefs of Staff, calls his Chinese counterpart, the highest ranking general in China, and says, uh, you know, I just want to let you know that everything's okay, you know, democracy is messy, but we're stable, more or less, we're in charge here, uh, we're not going to attack you, um, et cetera. And then again, on, I believe, January 8, 2021, two days after this so-called insurrection, it was, uh, you know, illegal trespassing, uh, a riot. I have no sympathy for people who broke the law that day, uh, but uh, but for 95% of the so-called insurrectionists, it was basically trespassing in, in the Capitol building and not more. Some of them were, were a little more extreme. It was far from, far from an insurrection. It was, a, it was a disorderly out of control, you know, with, again, some riot, a little bit of violence and uh, no sympathy for that. But, that it, but it wasn't more than that. And the Congress went about, on about its business. Uh, well, it turns out two days later, um, General Milley speaks to Nancy Pelosi, who's the our Speaker of the House, that's an important official, but she's not the president, she's not in the chain of command. Um, and she says, we're worried, you know, this is now the, the period, the three week period between, um, uh, you know, this early January riot and the inauguration, it was, actually it was about two weeks, um, that again, Trump's gonna start a nuclear war and Millie's telling her, don't worry, the nuclear fighting codes are under control. Uh, and, and more or less says, if we got that order, we wouldn't obey it. Um, he then convenes a meeting of top uh, commanders. We have, uh, you know, CENTCOM, Central Command, NORTHCOM, Northern Command. There, there are eight or nine of these uh, major commands around the world. Um, and basically takes gets a loyalty oath from the officers that um, they will only listen to him, meaning Milley, not listen to the president, et cetera. And by the way, that was, a, a, I keep coming back to this movie, but watch the movie it, it, and then read the papers. You'll see it, the parallels. That's what happened. The the uh, Burt Lancaster, who is the the villain, you know, the the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, gets the other members of the heads of the services together and, and gets them to pledge loyalty to him. Um, if I had been in the room, I wasn't. But if I had been in the room, and someone said, uh, "Jim, what do you think?" I would say, "You're a traitor. Uh, this is traitorous, and I want no part of it." And I'll I'll leave here and call the president, and let him know what you're up to. Apparently, that never happened. But uh, uh, and then you know, eventually, Biden was sworn in. The irony, of course, is that um, I, I, I was talking to some people I did an interview earlier today, and I said, 100 years from now, psychologists will have defined 
Trump derangement syndrome as a clinical disease, or actually identified as a mental illness. Uh, clearly, Millie was suffering from that, as are many, many others. But there's this idea that you know Trump would hold on at all costs and surround. It was all nonsense. Trump was the only president in um, recent memory. I mean, going back decades, who didn't start a war. Uh, you know, Obama started actions in Syria and Libya, and uh, Bush, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and Clinton and Serbia, and um, uh, you know, you can kind of go around the, uh, you know, go back uh, to all the presidents. Trump's the only one who didn't start a war tried to get us out of wars, was dis disobeyed by the, the military. Um, you know, he talked tough on NATO, but he never actually did anything. I mean, he got NATO to, to pay more money, which they should have all along, according to their agreements. So, you know, Tr Trump put tariffs on China, if you want to call that a trade war, fine. So, so Trump was tough. He was not a pushover. He uh, held our NATO allies uh, to their word when it came to military spending. He held the Chinese to their word when it came to uh, not... Uh, you know, breaking the rules of uh, the World Trade Organization. Uh, so he was tough as can be, talked a good game, but he actually didn't do anything crazy, but was accused of it all the time. And here we have Millie, who's supposed to be this anchor of stability, you know, the so-called adult in the room, I love that phrase, uh, acting like, a, I don't know, a spoiled child or, or a, someone with, a, um, like you said, mental illness, but clearly traitorous, uh, should be fired tonight should be court-martialed. Um, uh, there are numerous provisions in the Code of Military Justice, which, uh, which apply to active duty officers. Actually, it applies to some retired officers, depending on the facts. So he should be court-martialed uh, and put in prison. Uh, we'll give him a cell in Guantanamo next to, uh, you know, Sheikh, uh, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed uh, from 9-11 uh, from infamy. But um, I've never seen anything like it. I've been a close... Uh, when I was a, a nine-year-old, I wrote a letter to the White House. I asked for President Kennedy's autograph. They sent it to me. It was, you know, it was a facsimile, but nine-year-old, I didn't know any better. It was, like I said, I got the president's autograph. So I've been following politics, uh, international affairs, closely for decades. I got a graduate degree in international studies before I went to law school. I worked uh, for the world's largest international bank. Uh, it's my whole career is in geopolitics, and I've never seen any behavior as reprehensible as this. I mean, Millie, according to the book, went so far as to say, we're not going to attack you, but if we do, I'll call you and give you a heads up. You know, can you imagine uh, uh, General uh, Meade at Gettysburg uh, sending a messenger to Robert E. Lee saying, uh, don't worry, Lee, uh, if we're going to we're going to set up on a cemetery ridge, we'll let you know. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's beyond belief. And then what's more unbelievable is uh, President Biden comes out today, he says he has full confidence, those are his words, in General Milley. Well, I would say that that shows, uh, you know, so Milley's a traitor. The president has full confidence in him. I would say that shows you where Biden's head is, but Biden doesn't have a head. He's, he's senile. He's a senile sock puppet for whoever's around. So welcome to America. It's a good times and exciting times to be doing what we're doing. One of the policies that Trump was heavily criticized for during his reign was withdrawal of troops from, from many places around the world, including Germany and Afghanistan. And, and this supposedly made the world a more dangerous place. And then Biden has, has continued those policies, but he made a right mess of them in Afghanistan, which is our real topic today. What does the, the Afghanistan story mean for defense stocks and for defense spending longer term? And, and are there good recommendations to make now good investments? But let's start again with a bit of context of how you see what unfolded in Afghanistan with the, with, with the withdrawal. Was it just a, a botched withdrawal or is there something deeper going on uh, and how will the world see it? Well, uh, the, in, in philosophy and uh, analysis, there's, a, there's something called Occam's razor and it's all goes back to the Middle Ages. But the idea basically is if you have a simple explanation for something and a really complicated, convoluted, convoluted explanation, uh, odds are the simple explanation is correct. Uh, when you get into multiple factors, it's not just a little more complicated, it's immensely more complex and the idea that you could actually pull it off or that it wouldn't come to light or whatever is, is uh, highly improbable. So, so uh, you know, always keep digging, keep asking questions, but go with the simple explanation when you can. Uh, with regard to Afghanistan, the simple explanation is stupidity and incompetence. Um, that sounds right to me. That's, that's what I saw. Uh, I don't, uh, to say that there was a deep state plot to actually 
leave the weapons behind intentionally so you could arm the Taliban so they could be a power against, I don't know whom, uh, Iran. Uh, I mean, you can kind of spin a whole theory out of it. Um, things like that happen, but not with this crowd. They're, they're not bright enough to actually do something like that. Um, Blinken is a, is a lightweight. Um, uh, no one's worse than our, uh, our national security advisor, uh, who, uh, you know, again, unseasoned. These are people that they have all the they have all the degrees. OK, so they went to Harvard, they went to Yale, they went to Stanford. Uh, they were Rhodes Scholars, whatever. But it just shows you how little those credentials mean when you see how uh, how weak they are in the performance of their uh, of their duties. Um, I, I one of the things I, I noticed, because, again, I do think about this a lot, is they they elevate process over substance. Now, substance is what counts. You do need some process. You need some interagency coordination. You need, it's always good to get contrary views in the room, you know, don't shoot from the hip. Uh, that, that's all fine. But they take process to the point where it becomes the substance, as far as they're concerned, as long as the right interagency memos were circulated and everybody, uh, you know, they, we, we own the intelligence and military community. They use the, the word equities. Uh, everyone has equities. It means you have a voice. Uh, in, in the process, as, as long as all the equities were taken into account, everybody signed the memo, everybody got the memo, everyone went to the meeting, et cetera, then it must be okay. The idea that you're all working together like sheep running over a cliff never seems to occur to them. The fact that your ideas are moronic, have immensely negative consequences, doesn't seem to trouble them as long as the process went on long. Okay. Trump was quite the opposite. Trump, you know, like the Soviet Ukraine, so Obama never sent weapons to Ukraine, to basically the government in Kiev. Um, he sent uh, canned can goods, uh, what they call MREs, meals ready to eat. It's military ration. You open the top and it's good to go. It's got some protein or whatever. And blankets. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, Trump actually sent weapons, a lot of weapons, like anti-tank weapons, things that could take out Russian tanks, et cetera. And yet... Somehow Trump was branded as the guy who wasn't supporting Ukraine. He was actually impeached for it. Uh, and Obama is applauded. Well, why was that? Well, actually, I watched the, the first, with Trump, you have to distinguish between first impeachment and second impeachment. They were both, you know, unconstitutional farces, but they happened. Um, I watched the first impeachment hearings very closely. I couldn't in the second because there were no hearings, but that's a separate story. But they had all these people like Fiona Hill and George Kent and uh, the famous uh, uh, Vinman, uh, or, or as he would say, Lieutenant Colonel Vinman to you. You know, he was uh, uh, any time a military officer throws his rank out, you know, he's a weakling because the real heroes don't do that. I mean, I, I know a lot of Navy SEALs. I know I know a lot of generals. They don't they, they don't throw their rank around. I saw I saw a photograph of um, Eisenhower, uh, you know, Dwight Eisenhower recently in military uniform. And he had one, one little service, but this one. Okay. Now I'm sure he earned 50. I have no doubt about that, but he wore one. It meant something to him. It signified some, uh, some degree of uh, heroism or uh, strategic ability or whatever. Millie, uh, you know, my, my, my father fought in the Marine Corps in the Pacific in World War II. And uh he, uh, by the way, he earned a medal that was uh, a presidential unit citation twice for Paolo and Okinawa, equivalent to the Navy Cross, which is higher than any award, one, one notch below the Congressional Medal of Honor, higher than anything Millie has. But Millie's got, if you know, rows and rows and rows and rows of these colored battle ribbons or whatever. My father used to call that fruit salad. Whenever he saw a general wearing that, he said he's got you know, fruit salad on his chest. Um, but, uh, but that's... Um, I mean that's what we're uh, th that's what we're dealing with, uh, but the uh, so they've got the credentials, they've got the process, but they don't pay attention to the substance. Um, but what happened in Afghanistan? I don't really want to belabor it because I think most of our listeners are, have followed the story and probably very well aware of it. But you know, the, just to say the obvious points, if you're with, and it's not about the withdrawal. That's a fair debate. Okay, so some Americans, a lot of people want to think just get out of Afghanistan. In Twenty years is enough. Others said, you know, hey, we got, we got it down to 2,500 troops. We haven't had any casualties in 18 months. We're supporting our the Afghan regular forces with air power and intelligence and drones, et cetera. It's, we're, we got a lid on it. It's not, not that, uh, you know, it was, it was all good, but, but um, it, was a, it was getting to be a low-cost presence 
for a big strategic footprint. Now, that was the case for staying there. If you want to get out, that's okay. Yeah, that's a fair debate. Uh, I'm, I'm open to both sides of that one. But it's how you get out. That's what that's what was was uh, not just botched. That's an understatement. Um, so so why do you take the troops out before the civilians? Why do you take the troops out at all before you get the weapons out? You know, not approximately ninety billion dollars, ninety billion Black Hawk helicopters, uh, rocket pro- uh, propelled grenades, um, you know, machine guns. Uh, the, you know, the M4, which we have. The popular rifle in the United States is, is the AR-15. The M4 is the fully automatic, you know, uh, military version of that. Some modified for Special Operations Command. Um, you know, armored personnel carriers, Humvee, on and on and on. Communications equipment, drones, etc. All of which I guarantee you is being sold to the Chinese and the Russians as we speak, and they will reverse engineer it and learn quite a bit about it. Why can't you at least? Couldn't you at least disable it if you said hey, we can't get it out logistically? Fine, you know. Rip out the rip out the, uh, uh, the the semiconductors. Rip out the SIM cards. Rip rip out whatever the brains of whatever equipment you're leaving behind. Blow it up. Burn it down. Uh, you know, do whatever you have to do, but don't leave it to the enemy. Uh, and above all, don't leave Americans behind enemy lines. When uh, you know, when General Lee retreated from Gettysburg after after the Battle of Gettysburg, he lost the battle. But he retreated, went back to Virginia, and the war continued. But he didn't suffer casualties in the retreat. Uh, General Meade actually didn't pursue him. It was a little controversial. But but we did. We retreated. We, I would say we surrendered to Afghanistan. We retreated in disorder and suffered 13 dead in the process and, and, and a number of wounded, um, uh, 11 Marines, uh, a Navy corpsman and a uh, a uh, corpsman and, a, um, and, and a, a soldier, someone in the Army. Um, couldn't even do that right. We couldn't even surrender right. Um, so, so it was a disaster. Now, taking that and kind of putting it in the economic frame, because I know that was the question, um, this has implications for the U.S. dollar. And uh, I get asked frequently, you know, is, is the dollar, is the strong dollar, the dollar as well as reserve currency, et cetera, is that the key, is that the key to U.S. power in the world? And I would say, well, the two are related, but you sort of have it backwards. The power is the key to why the dollar is so strong. In other words, um, you know, whether it's a dollar or euro, an Australian dollar, a Canadian dollar, um, people will say, well, that's not backed by anything. Or they look at you know, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies and they say, they're not backed by anything. Even gold for that matter. I mean, gold's physical, tangible. You can touch it. It's gold. It's got a great track record, but it's not backed by anything. There's nothing behind gold that says gold's valuable. It's just, you, you think it's valuable or you don't, but, um, but there's nothing backing, there's nothing backing any of any form of money except one thing, which is confidence. Uh, if I'm gonna tender money to you and you're confident that it's money and then you furthermore feel that you can turn around and um, give it to someone else and they'll accept it because they're confident that it's money and so forth, then it's money. Uh, and, you know, dollar, euro, yen, yuan, gold, et cetera. But, you know, throughout history, we've had shells, beads, um, uh, feathers, uh, all kinds of money. And today we have cryptocurrencies, credit cards, debit cards. They're all money, but they're all backed by confidence. And uh, But confidence is uh, easily lost and very difficult to regain, for one thing. So it's a lot more fragile than central bankers realize. But, but if you want to say, well, why are people confident in the U.S. dollar? Well, it's because they think we have a stable country, a stable democracy, a rule of law. And, you know, if you have a dollar debt, you can go and the person doesn't pay. You can go into court and, uh, and get relief or get um, uh, some, uh, you know, some kind of remedy. Um, and that's all backed up by military power. So when you see the U.S. in a, uh, I would say, disgraceful, humiliating um, the surrender of the kind we just went through in Afghanistan, that destroys confidence in the United States, but it does more than that. It starts to weaken confidence in the dollar. Um, and by the way, it wasn't just uh, our friends in, the, uh, I should say, enemies in China and Russia who are applauding the U.S. disarray. NATO is asking the same question. I dare say Australia is. Um, they're Because uh, uh, we had NATO allies in Afghanistan. It wasn't just Americans, pr- predominantly Americans, but uh, you know the Brits were there. Um, the, uh, the the Dutch actually fought quite quite a bit. 
uh, Australia consistently shows up. Australians are good fighters. Uh, so the, um, so the, there was a number of countries and allies, some NATO, some not, who were with us in Afghanistan. We didn't tell them. Biden never called, Biden never called Boris, John, uh, Boris Johnson or uh, Angela Merkel or uh, uh, you know, a, any of uh, the heads of any of our allies to tell them what we were doing. They were embarrassed. They were caught out. They had to scramble to get their own citizens out and actually, dare say, rescued a few Americans. Um, why is that? Now, what kind of leadership? That's, well, that's not any kind of leadership. That's, I, I, again, I, I don't know how to describe it quite because I've never seen it before in my life. Now, that has implications for the dollar. If you're Europe right now, you, you got to be saying, well, you know, uh, maybe NATO is not all it's cracked up to be if the U.S. is not reliable. So maybe we, the European states, need to um, step up our defense. And by the way, coordinate our defense efforts, spend more um, have a unified defense effort. Certainly, um, you know, Australia is on the front lines as far as China is concerned. Um, uh, India is a rising power. Um, you know, the Indian, uh, I was glad to see one bit of good news today. The UK and the US are going to work with Australia to provide Australia with nuclear submarines. That's a, that's a good move. Um, and, uh, and Japan, I mean, Japan, instead of looking like an extension of the United States, all of a sudden looks like part of an archipelago with Taiwan. Um, if, if China's going to invade Taiwan, why stop there? I mean, the U.S. doesn't have your back and China, Japan doesn't have nuclear weapons. Why not take over Japan? By the way, Japan could have nuclear weapons in about six months. They have the technology, but they've refrained partly because of the U.S. nuclear umbrella. But how can you count on that? So the world is uh, looking at this and sizing up the situation, saying, what do we need to do to bolster our own defense? How should we conduct monetary policy if we no longer have confidence in the United States? That has huge implications for the dollar. Now, um, I do think it's the case. I know it's the case that in every, no matter how dire the situation is, there's always an opportunity. There's always something for investors to do. You don't have to crawl up in a ball. And I would suggest that um, defense stocks and intelligence stocks might be uh, a very good investment right now. And people say, well, wait a second, Jim, you're just talking about the decline of US power, the loss of confidence in the United States. Why on earth would I want to invest in US defense stocks? And the answer is, um, we've been here before, we mean in the United States, let's go back to 1979. Um, Russia invaded Afghanistan uh, and President Carter said he was surprised at that. I think he was the only one who was surprised. You can kind of see that coming. Um, and then at the same time, Iran or slightly earlier, Iranians took hostages from the U.S. Embassy in Tehran as the U.S. was on its way out of Iran, uh, held those hostages for um, about a year and a half. Um, and then we attempted a hostage rescue, which failed. The helicopter crashed in the desert. We took casualties in a failed rescue attempt, let alone not being able to pull off the rescue. And then after that happened, Carter said, well, we're, we're not going to try that again. He was like General Milley telling the enemy what we're not going to do. Um, and then uh, around that time, it was slightly earlier, the United States Treasury issued, I believe it was, this was 1978, it could be off by year, but 77, 78, right there, when inflation was raging in the United States, nobody wanted dollars. The dollar was uh, near a, a, an all-time low. Uh, the United States Treasury issued treasury bonds denominated in Swiss francs. Uh, people forget about that. We call them Carter bonds. Uh, they were U.S. Treasury bonds, full faith and credit of the United States, but they were denominated Swiss francs because nobody wanted dollars. So, and gold was on its way to eight hundred dollars an ounce. And I, I always say gold is the same. It's just uh, I think of gold by weight. If if gold goes from thirty five dollars an ounce to eight hundred dollars an ounce, which it did between seventy one and nineteen eighty, what's really happening? Well, what's really happening is the value of the dollar is going down eighty five percent because it takes. Uh, and I was, it used to be $35 got you announced. Now $800 got you announced. It's still announced at gold. That hasn't changed. But the dollar has lost its value. And in that case, 85, 90% of its value. So when I talk about, you know, an 80% collapse in the dollar, in the value of the dollar, people go, well, that will never happen. I said, it just did. It happened in uh, between, uh, you know, happened in the late 1970s. So that was a pretty dire state of affairs. But what did America do? Well, we elected Ronald Reagan, got rid of Carter. Um, Carter ran again. He lost in his, in his attempt to get a second term. He elected Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan and Paul Volcker got inflation under control. Uh, they then set about restoring our defense. 
Uh, the, this was the uh, the time of the 600 ship Navy and so-called Star Wars and Star Wars, but technically the strategic defense initiative, basically the ability to shoot down missiles in midair, which was viewed as a pipe dream at the time. Now we do it routinely. I mean, the Iron Dome and all these uh, Patriot missiles and all these systems, they shoot down missiles. That's what they do. Um, so uh, and and along the way, uh, in 1985, the dollar hit an all time high. It got so strong that James Baker had to call the Plaza Accord to get uh, um, the rest of the world to agree to um, uh, weaken the dollar. We were trying to weaken it on purpose because it was too strong. And then they had the Louvre Accord in 1987 to, to stabilize it. So uh, we got rid of inflation. We had a super strong dollar. We reestablished our credit. We built up our defense. 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. And December 25th, 1991, the Soviet Union dissolved and we won the Cold War. So in the space of, in that case, 10 years, maybe 12 years, if you want to stretch it to the end of the Soviet Union, we went from being so, um, you know, un untrusted that we had to issue bonds in a foreign currency like Argentina uh, to taking out the Soviet Union and freeing, liberating Eastern Europe. So we can turn it around. Americans are capable of that. But the, the question is, will we? That, and that's, that's a really big open question. Um, if the Republicans can retake the Congress in 2022, I think the odds of that are very good. Uh, you know, it's too early to put a stake in the ground, but that looks good. No, well, no, one should never underestimate the ability of the Republican Party to screw things up. But right now they're, they're in pretty good shape. Um, and then we take the White House in 2024 with, a, you know, you name it, Ron DeSantis, the Ted Cruz, or Rand Paul. Uh, that's the thing about the Republicans is uh, they have a very deep bench. I could name 10 Republicans, I might prefer one over the other, but any one of them would make a great president. When you get to the Democrats, you've got Biden is pushing 80, is clearly senile. Senator Dianne Feinstein reportedly, uh, not a doctor, but reportedly is more senile than, than Joe Biden. Um, Nancy Pelosi is 80 years old. I, I, I worry about her in, in public because I think some of that plastic surgery is, is in danger of falling off. Um, and and uh, the Democratic leadership, they've hung on so long, so, you know, into their 80s at this point, that they haven't groomed uh, a, a bench. They don't actually have, where are, the, where are the really brilliant 45 year old, I'm so sick of baby boomers running things, and I'm one of them, but I'm like, get, let's, get me, let's get some 45 year olds in here, or 50 year old or something. I'm sick of these uh, 70 year olds running things. Um, there are other things to do when you're 70, I guess, but... Uh, but running a country is probably not one of them. Um, so the Republicans could be set up to retake the White House and the Congress over the next three years. The question is, will so much damage be done in the meantime that it's too late to remedy the situation? It's too late to have a Ronald Reagan who can turn things around. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. Hopefully it's not too late, but, it, but the jury's out. In the meantime, as an investor, what do you do? Well, a bet that the U.S. will actually right the ship um, and, and reinvigorate defense off a low base, not in terms of spending money. We spend enough money. We got great equipment. I went to, uh, uh, you know, this past weekend was 9-11. Uh, we, have, we have a very large airport here where I live. I'm in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a, an Air Force base. Not, not exactly a base, but it's an Air Force uh, transshipment depot. But they've got two 6,000-foot runways, which are huge. So we had an air show um, and uh, I was quite, uh, quite impressed. One, one thing I saw was a super galaxy. That's the, the largest um, cargo transport, the C5A. And sorry, I just hit my lamp here. And, uh, and the, you know, the nose was open so you could walk in. And this was the one you've probably seen the famous photograph of the 800 Afghanis crowded into one. Nobody had any seatbelts or anything. They were just standing around. Well, go into one. This didn't have 800 Afghanis in it, but it was the same plane, uh, and it's huge. It's unless you've been in one, it's kind of hard to describe. But um, but I also saw the F-22, F-16s, F-15s, uh, F-35s, uh, and the the F-22, uh, the Raptor, put on. Um, that was part of the air show. It was doing um, ac acrobatics, but I was. Yeah, read about it, but to see it, it's a huge plane. It's not, it's not like a little fiberglass biplane. It would go straight up. It would stop, stop in midair. This giant plane stop mid, tumble, you know, regain its aerodynamics, you know, swoop to the ground, fly up. Everyone's like, it can go Mach two, yeah. 
it can also go 89 miles an hour. And I, I drive faster than that a lot of times, but they, but they, they, they demonstrated that. They said, imagine you're chasing them at a thousand miles an hour. He slows down to 89, you go right past them. I mean, this is amazing stuff, but it's not enough. Um, you need intelligence assets. You need, um, you need strategy. Um, you need, uh, you know, some defenses against hypersonic missiles because they're coming, you know, the qu query uh, is the aircraft carrier today, what the battleship was in 1941. Uh, battleship was the ship of the line. And of course we lost most of our battleship fleet or a lot of our battleship fleet at Pearl Harbor. We didn't lose the war. Why? Well, we had aircraft carriers. It turned out they were a lot more important and we sank the Japanese at the Battle of Midway. Um, is something like that going on where the aircraft carrier is now more of a sitting dock than an offensive platform? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm just saying these are this is how you have to think about it. But but in doing so, um, the my view, the Congress will appropriate the money and companies like um, Raytheon, um, Lockheed, uh, Boeing's had its problems on the civilian side, but it has a very large defense sector and space. Uh, sector. A lot of space satellites are put up by Boeing. Um, there's a, uh, a company called uh, Lidos, L-E-I-D-O-S. No one's ever heard of it. That's okay. They're the number one intelligence contractor. And then they, again, there's always an overlap between intelligence and defense, but um, they, they're very far along in uh, uh, artificial intelligence and um, you know, digital communications, encryption, a lot of other disciplines run by a guy named Roger Crone. I know Roger. He Roger used to be the CEO of the Aerospace and Defense Division of Boeing, which by itself is bigger than most companies. Now he's the CEO of Lidos. Very, very solid, smart guy, great guy. Um, so, uh, um, so, so there are, uh, you know, I don't have a comprehensive list, but there are companies in the defense sector and the intelligence sector that have been a little bit beaten down because all you hear about is the Democrats want to cut defense spending, but they may have to have the opposite reaction. They may to, if you're a Democrat and you want to restore your credibility before the 2024 election, what would you do? Well, one of them might be a, a big commitment to defense that could actually help them. So that could be a very interesting sector. One of the, the angles that I want to ask you about is almost the converse of that, which is what about all these other nations that are looking at what's happening in, in Afghanistan? And, and what Biden said, I know I followed the news in, in the US, but also in Japan, in Germany, in Australia, in the UK. And all the headlines were about how suddenly America's abandoned all of us and now we need to ramp up our defense spending. Right. Who would they be spending their money on if they don't ramp up their spending as they're required to under NATO? Would it be you know, the US defense stocks that benefit from that? Or should I be looking in, in the local markets? I know Australia has some good defense stocks um, that might get a lot of, a lot of uh, yes, a lot of purchases or a lot of custom from governments, perhaps even around the world. In Japan, there's loads of good defense stocks as well, which are very difficult to access. Um, but uh, there's a few down the road. Um, to, to be honest, uh, there's a mine maker and an assault rifle maker. So I, I think these, these stocks might be a better opportunity because they've been beaten down for a very long time because all these other countries around the world have not been living up to the defense spending, uh, at least to the defense spending that, that you know, should be expected of them. That was one of Trump's messages. Do right. you think that might be a better place to look, these these more local defense stocks in places like Australia and the UK? I think both could do well. I think you make a very good point about, um, uh, let's say, local, you know, international or your busy countries other than the United States. Uh, and the reason is that if you're going to spend, um, I mean, we're talking upwards of trillions of dollars when you take all the major, you know, G7, uh, um, you know, and allied countries together, but certainly hundreds of billions for openers and then upwards of trillions. Um, but if you're Australia and, and they say, okay, Australia, you know, you're, you're, turned, to, you're turned to have nuclear submarines. Uh, they're not cheap. Um, I have a, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm on the water here across from me. I don't know if the viewers can see in the background is the, uh, the oldest Navy base in the United States. It's been here since the uh, 18th century. Uh, on Portsmouth, New Hampshire, one of our local uh, you know, favorite sons is uh, John Paul Jones, a famous admiral of the, uh, the U.S. Navy, said, don't, you know, don't give up the ship. Uh, and he didn't. So uh, but but there are I can look out my window and see three nuclear submarines out there. It's, it's a major. There are only four facilities in the world that can do repairs on U.S. submarine, U.S. nuclear submarines. And one of them is, again, out the window here. Um, but if you're Australia and you're going to build your own, 
you're going to want um, a big part of that spending in Australia. You're not going to want to just pay, you know, General Dynamics uh, in, uh, in in Norfolk, Virginia, to build your submarines for you. You may they may you know get built there, uh, but you're going to want your suppliers to have a role. You're going to want your scientists to have a role. So yeah, the, they'll be Australia will say, okay, we'll do it, but we want some percent some portion of this budget to go to Australia and Sparta, and it will. And same thing in the UK um, and and Japan and elsewhere. And, um, you know, remember, it's not just defense spending, aerospace, that's important, but the intelligence and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a whole new field. Um, I'm I'm involved in it through... um, uh, through a company I started a few years ago, we're private, so we're not, you know, we're not we can't be traded. But uh, um, it, it's and it's popping up everywhere. So far, we're, we're actually trying to help uh, one of our top research universities create a center of artificial intelligence um, that would, you know, be the, the equivalent of Silicon Valley. If you want to do something uh, in technology, you go to Silicon Valley. If you're into biomedical research, at least in the United States. We have something called the Research Triangle in North Carolina. It's a uh, Raleigh, uh, Durham, Winston Salem, and just you know, University of North Carolina. A lot of laboratories, pharmaceutical companies down there. We're trying to do something equivalent in artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence will be applied in all these weapon systems. So, um, so that's so. I would say intelligence stocks, AI stocks, artificial intelligence. When I say intelligence. I'm talking about the you know this you know, James Bond type stuff. Um, Artificial intelligence, which is a branch of uh, uh, um, you know, computer science, but it's more than that. Uh, and then, of course, pure defense, which are some of the ones we talked about. But absolutely, um, you know, Japan might be light on the defense side, but might be a lot more advanced on the technology side. Australia, I'm sure, has both. Um, uh, you know, Taiwan semiconductor is an old favorite, um, and I'm sure the UK and France. France is number one, along with Russia, uh, number one and number two producers of uh, nuclear power plants, but they certainly have a lot of uh, enrichment technology. Um, you know, Germany is an engineering uh, workhorse of the world. So yeah, I, I, by all means, uh, this is not just a US play. US might be the biggest in it, but, um, uh, but all these other countries are not gonna spend a lot of money without some of that going to their local manufacturers and technology firms. So there is a world of opportunity. Let's finish with a, a trick question. Do you think it's really a good idea to be giving Australians nuclear submarines? Yes, because um, it, you know, just go back to his, why, what was the uh, foundation, if you will, the British Empire? Uh, it was the Royal Navy. Uh, and you know, particularly after the Battle of Trafalgar, when they kind of soundly defeated the, uh, um, it was a French, you know, Spanish Navy. Uh, but, um, and they, you know, Britannia rules the waves, uh, and they did, um, at least up until, uh, up until World War II. But, um, if the, the answer, uh, the answer, Nick, is just get a map, uh, somewhere along the way, since I was in school that America stopped teaching geography, I don't know why, but, uh, I was, I, I studied it a lot. I still study it. I don't even use these GPS things in a car. I have them, but I prefer maps and figuring out my own routes. So I think it's a, it's an important skill, you know, when the power grid goes down, these map reading skills are gonna come back strong. Um, but, uh, but get a map and look at China. And what you'll see is that it's surrounded by islands on, on its East coast, its Pacific coast. Now you can go to the central part of China. There's a landmass, the Eurasian, Eurasian landmass, but um, a big portion of that is desert, not a, not a very hospitable place to move across. You go southwest, you get into Tibet, which the whole place is 7,000 feet. The highest places are 29,000 feet. Um, And, you know, impassable. Uh, You know, they're spending tens of billions to build railroads to Tibet, but that's so they can maintain military control. You get in a a train that the the train is pressurized like an airplane uh, because there's not much oxygen at those altitudes. Um, but those are not very uh, accessible routes. I know all about the you know the, the Belt and Road Initiative, but you know, good luck running trains when, when it's 100 below zero or 50 below zero or whatever. Um, so uh, they they pretty much look to the sea and all their um, infrastructure and in major cities, financial centers, manufacturing hubs, etc., are all along that uh, Pacific coast. But it's not really the Pacific coast. It's the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the Sea of Japan. 
and then surrounded by islands. What are the islands? Well, the Aleutian Islands, part of Alaska, get pretty close. Then you have Japan, starting with uh, 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 Honshu Hokkaido. and Hokkaido and so forth. Then skip down to um, Taiwan with, with a lot of smaller islands in between, Okinawa and so forth. Then you hit the Philippines, uh, then Indonesia, and circles over to Southeast Asia. It's surrounded. You can't get, and China has no oil, no, no oil to speak of. They're, they're burning coal. One of the reasons Australia is doing well is because buying all this coal from Australia, they don't have any oil. Um, and so that oil comes to the Middle East and it has to go through just a couple choke points, Straits of Hormuz, Straits of Malacca, uh, and then between one or more of these islands uh, in the South China Sea, uh, or a little further up by Taiwan. So those are, I won't say easy, but they are it can be completely, completely interdicted by the U.S. Navy today. Um, but it's good to have friends, it's good to have allies. And so the, the Quad, um, which has been ridiculed, but that's, that's, that's a serious effort. That is a game changer. The Quad, of course, is Japan, Australia, India, and the United States. Well, Look at again, look at a map. They those countries surround China and control the sea lanes. So, yes, Australia has always done their, their bit, uh, more than their bit. They're they're you know some of the toughest fighters in the world. Um, but they want to be on the cutting edge. And uh um, you know, the way you interdict those straits is you know, it's nice to have a big aircraft carrier and a and an aircraft carrier battle fleet um nearby, but submarines are are a big part of it. So yeah, Australia will uh, We'll join the club. I'm a little bit more concerned than you because the Australians lost the war against emus, a flightless unarmed bird in 1932. So I'm not so sure giving us nuclear submarines is the best <laughs> idea. But Jim, yeah. thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us at home. I hope you enjoyed this and look forward to some analysis and possibly some defence stock recommendations. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Eric.